here. We got uh, an awesome person to talk to to give us the lay of the land of an incredible company. But first, let's dive into who he is and learn a little bit more about his background. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, Love to watch your podcast. Glad I actually get to do it this time. Um, so this is what my 20th geo -int. Does that cover all of them? It covers all of them plus one. There was actually one minor event here in Orlando in 20, in 2003. Yeah. During the hurricane. Oh, wow. Oddly enough. Uh, but no, uh, I, that kind of speaks to about a 38 year history uh, in this business, you know, coming out of the army and going into, uh, after 92, going into large corporations, large system integrators from Northrop to Raytheon to Lidos, Maxar, a number of others. Um, and then became involved with, uh, but got involved with the tradecraft through the army. They actually paid for me to go to grad school back in 86 when um, uh, geospatial sciences was something very new, especially satellite imaging. Okay. Um, they, had, they saw that I majored in geology in college, so the Army offered to pay for me to go get a degree in uh, image processing satellites, somehow they related the two of them. Um, but yeah, through that, through that um, space from the Army, I actually came into it and started up with Pixel uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, decided to go back to my roots, which was remote sensing image processing, hyperspectral imaging. Um, in fact, Back when I first started looking into hyperspectral imaging in 90, our founders weren't born yet. Uh, that shows you how fast the technology is, is scaling. Kind of mind blowing. Yeah, it is, it is. And so I, I like it here and I think this is a great way to, at some point, start to retire. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been technical side, I've been the business side, I've been on the executive management side, the, the people side, but um, it's really about the mission, I guess. Um, I'm very impassioned by it. It's the one thing I have in common when I go talk to a customer. It's often not the technology. It's it's the topic of what we're trying to do together, right? Well, I want to come back to that, uh, yeah. we'll call it passion based off your experience uh, yeah. eventually, but let's talk about Pixel for a second. Sure. Uh, give us an overview of who Pixel is and uh, what they're trying to accomplish. Sure. Well, on the, on the foundation level, we were founded in 2019, uh, headquartered in Los Angeles. Uh, a couple 20 year olds in, in grad school had come up with this idea of uh, building a hyperspectral sensor to kind of cover spectral and spatial all in one big collection. And so um, once founded in 2019, they had begun a series of ventures to launch three, what turned out to be three Pathfinder satellites. So they did a, a pretty good raise of funds in the beginning then ran a series A and ran a series B. We're sitting around 71 million. We'll probably close series B a little bit above that here in, in the near future. Um, the company is headquartered in LA, but we have a significant office and manufacturing and assembly in, uh, in, in uh, Bangalore, India. Uh, we have about 190 people there. We have about 23 people, three people here in the United States, uh, about 31,000 square feet in Bangalore, of which a good part of it is actual manufacturing, clean rooms, uh, our analytic teams who are developing some of the algorithms, our platforms. Um, that's that's kind of the pixel in nutshell. Okay, you're you're building a hyperspectral satellite constellation, right? Yeah. So, what's the expected uh, capabilities of the constellation itself? So, the three pathfinders. There's one that's remaining on orbit right now, and that will start to come out of service here in the near future, right in time for June and July, where we'll launch uh, start launching between July and October the six of our first constellation of Venier hyperspectral systems. So it'll be six satellites, 160 bands apiece. The neat thing about these are that, uh, which sort of sets them apart, it's 4.8 meter nominal resolution, or resolution, we, we're rounding it at five meter resolution. But they've got 40 kilometer swath, okay. which is a pretty significant swath. And as long as the shutter can stay open, so to speak, without burning up, uh, we're getting pretty long, long pass. So we've got a polar orbit, we're sun synchronous. Revisit rate? Uh, revisits once daily globally. Okay. Um, the six satellites, as I said, are B near. So we're going from, for those who know, the around uh, 467 to 905 nanometers. Right. Uh, and uh, as I said, 160 bands in that range. So we're looking two to 11 nanometer bandwidth, whereas a lot of systems we see today, 
ones that I know and love are 50, 80 nanometer width. Yeah, That's a big and, difference, and right? And those who don't understand what's the value added for doing something. I know it's obvious to yeah. folks like you and I, but let's kind of, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, I've been trying to think of the, the best way to describe it, you know, and I always think of if you had, if, if you had a, and I'm going to come up with a new one right on the spot. If you had a bunch of marbles lined up about three inches apart and you were to just have this rake that had tongs eight, 12 inches apart, you're just going to try and scoop those marbles up. The fact that those tongs are so spaced so far apart, you're not going to catch many marbles. Right. Right. Hyperspectral is similar in that if you have, think of those marbles now as each marble is something we want to know about a material, a specific uh, a chemical composition, biochemical composition. But now we have very, very fine needles in that push broom, if you will. And we're pulling that, just think about it that way. We're trying to pull that apart. The fact that those bandwidths are so close together, we're actually going to be able to isolate each one of those. Right. So the narrower the bandwidth, the, 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 essentially the more discreet um, the feature of the object that we want to know, or the composition, or the condition. So that, that's where, where hyperspectral sits. It, and because of that discreteness, um, it's, you, we have to de design the systems differently. The image processing challenges are different. Uh, we have to get a lot of light in, in that specific wavelength. So it's a, it's a neat, neat technology. It's been around for a while, but commercials only come on board, you know, really in the past four years. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, taking it a little bit one step deeper, can you talk about, uh, give me a use case that, you know, something from EO or SAR that's traditionally looked at with those sensors uh, that you feel hyperspectral can just complement or significantly look at to bring new insights to? Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, I grew up on Landsat and Spot and, Mac and worked at Maxar. Um, these, are the, these are the broader band um, multispectral systems because they're broadband, they get lots of light, they're very crisp, right. and they have high resolution. We're oh, looking, yeah. you know, half a meter resolution. And now with other companies coming on board at 15 or 10 centimeter resolution. The challenge though, is that when we're looking at, um, looking at subtle features, say within certain species of plants, if we're looking at subtle differences in mineralogical composition as indicators of what might be suitable or not suitable for mining, if we're looking at um, forest settings and trying to understand uh, the volume, uh, essentially the yield of a crop or of a, of a, of a harvest. Um, Maybe even the health of it. Or the health. Right. Uh, because we can also get some volume information as well. Or we're trying to understand, you know, the amount of lignin or we're trying to understand, you know, the certain stresses. The larger systems will be able to do that. We've been determining jack pine from spruce for, for decades. The question is, um, what, what specific species or subspecies is that if there's an infestation, say, from bark beetle or an in infestation from spruce budworm defoliation, it's not only can we detect that, and it's really hard to do with broader band systems. Hyperspectral systems do a great job. But the next question is, how soon in the process of change can you detect an event inside of a, inside of a, a plant, for example? Right. So what we're really trying to do is not only see change, because we all will see change eventually. If it's if it, the plant dies, it's changed. It's pretty obvious. Right. We want to get in there as soon as possible, understand when does the first signs of stress start, and that's a spectral signature. It's in the spectral signature. So that's the other that's the other thing that we're able to do. Uh, we team up with with radar folks. I mean, I. I taught SAR for a while. Well, and if Very I can different. add a, a different type of analogy, what I like talking to people, if I were to relate uh, uh, the different sensor types or what hyperspectral is compared to EO, for example, right. I tell people, it's like, well, think about the Hubble telescope on how it's helped out to look at space, yeah. identify planets and exoplanets. Uh, but then you bring in the James Webb telescope, and now it not only identifies uh, some of those exoplanets, but now can identify the chemical composition, composition of right. some of those exoplanets in terms of the atmosphere. And that's hyperspectral compared to EO. So, well, and, and you, okay, let's turn that on camouflage. You know, right. a lot of times um, we get questions, but can you detect camouflage? And everyone pretty much can. We go a step beyond, we've been asked, well, do you know what kind of material the camouflage is? Is it a polypropylene? Is it some other sort of plastic? Um, what kind of cloth is it? Uh, what kind of paint 
are we seeing on a certain, um, not color, but what kind. Right. Uh, we're, we're trying to push that theoretical envelope into something practical, doing it from in situ measurements or on a boom 15 meters above the ground or even a UAV is one thing. Doing it from 560 kilometers in space, that's well, an interesting and, problem. And, the, and if you identify the uh, what material, yeah. you, uh, you can identify if that's just a canvas covered a camouflage or if it's a type of uh, material that could, is painted on Right. Not just from the color, but the uh, material. Right. You can determine if that's actually a hardened bunker facility, not just a canvas that happens to be over a piece of equipment. Right, right. It, exactly. And it was interesting that we had a, uh, the Space Force has stood up something called Global Data Marketplace, and where they put solicitations with rapid turnaround needs out to the community to go look at. And one of the solicitations that came through was related to the, uh, there was a, a ship attacked by the, the Houthis over in, Northern Africa, Northwestern Africa, and spilled it fertilizer into the waters. Right. And it affects the near shore, littoral, and inland uh, as well. And so they specifically are asking for hyperspectral in those situations because it's not accessible by many aircraft, but it is accessible through the satellites. Uh, but in those cases, we want to partner with other companies as well. In the case, SAR is very good at finding, you know, Lambertian versus diffuse surfaces. You can see oil slicks. What hyperspectral does comes in and says, well, how thick? Well, and and and, uh, and you're still, and you're still a victim of uh, regular phenomenologies and uh, sensor inhibitions too. So, right. as strong as hyperspectral is, and as strong as radar is in the spectrum environments, each have their strengths and weaknesses. Sure. And that's why you complement. SAR right. is really good at weather penetrating; doesn't see everything that you can. But yeah. uh, hyperspectral is a victim of cloud cover too. Well, and you got to be you got to be willing to call out your weaknesses when you have them. Right. Not because. Um, Maybe you can't even make them better, but I think one of the reasons we, we do that is so we can find complementary technologies. Exactly. Narrow bands mean lower photon counts on that sensor, basically. And the narrower the band, the higher the, the, the challenge of suppressing noise in the system. Yeah. Whereas broader band systems um, have very nice, clean spectral signatures, but they're not getting down to the narrow. So how do we merge those two together? Yes. Uh, so yeah, you have to be willing to accept your weaknesses to compensate because again it's about the mission not the technology all the time so all right well um as we wrap up i want to kind of go back to the beginning here yeah. um uh, with your breadth of experience in the industry uh what has uh what makes you so passionate about hyperspectral moving forward as you reach this uh this point in your career so when i started it was literally we were still pretty keen on wet film going to digital then we got into these digital cameras, and then we got into going from color film to IR, and then I got into radar, and I saw this very slow adoption period uh, over many years until now we have commercial radar. And I kind of feel the same about hyperspectral. Um, at, at this point in my career, to see something so soon, uh, in a, from a commercials perspective, so soon in its development, and to see what I can do to accelerate it, um, that's what excites me about it. Uh, and the educational part. It, you know, you just don't put data in front of people anymore. It has a consultative aspect to it. Right. So, you know, you, you, you know how it goes. You don't just go, so, well, here's a hyperspectral sensor. I want to be able to also explain the technology, shift that paradigm from that, what is spatial, you definitely think spatial, narrow, high resolution, small objects, to move into um, spectral. Because even though our pixels are five meters by five meters, we can actually see materials inside of that five meter by five meter pixel that occupy smaller than five meter by five meter Perfect. space, sub-pixel analysis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, uh, when is the launch? So the launch is gonna be end, uh, actually the first week of July, we'll be launching both in California and in- That's uh, right India. around the corner, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. We're looking forward to it. Uh, awesome, oh, well, for those interested in learning more about Pixel, and uh, reaching out to you if they're interested, where do they uh, where do they go? Well, you can come straight to me to our website, pixel.space. Um, we're all found everywhere, so. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Skip, for the conversation, yep. and Thanks love that, learning more about you and uh, where Pixel is going. Great, great. All right. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm Adam Simmons from Project Geospatial. We'll talk to everybody next time.